just if I wouldn't mind giving a lecture, um, <clears throat> I came up with the topic aesthetics and a periodontal practice more because, you know, I was for many years of the opinion, like I'm sure some of you are, <clears throat> that as a periodontist, there isn't a lot that we deal with with regards to aesthetics. Um, and mainly when we think of aesthetics, we think of basically clinic, acidic clinical crown lengthening for patients who have gummy smiles and want to change that. Or we think of gingival recession correction when people don't like the, the aesthetics of that. <clears throat> and we think that's about it. Um, and like I said, for many years, I was of that opinion as well. And then I slowly started becoming aware of other aspects of aesthetics and realized that aesthetics ultimately actually impacts most, if not all of what we do. And I'm speaking from a periodontist point of view, but I think it's essential from a dentist point of view as well. So a lot of my talk is not gonna focus so much on the perio as it is hopefully principles for you to follow, even if you're a general practitioner to look in. And it may be that most of you, if not all of you know everything about what I'm saying. I don't know, I don't know what, what level, so please forgive me if I'm boring you. But I'm one of those who always believes to speak to the person who knows the least, rather than losing the person who knows less. Um, <clears throat> so what is aesthetics? Okay, when we speak about aesthetics, is this an aesthetic thing? If you ask most of the guys, and I know I'm sounding a bit sexist here, they'll think this is a thing of beauty. You know, is this aesthetics? If you ask Many of the ladies, they'll think this is a thing of beauty and the guys won't. Although in today's day and age, maybe the opposite way. Ladies may like the car and guys may like the dress. You know, it's new world, new times we live in. <clears throat> but the point is, we can find aesthetics in a lot of things. If you ask me, this looks like a painting my four-year-old has done. But if you ask some art ex expert, they may think that this is an absolutely aesthetic piece of art. Some people will find this house aesthetic. <clears throat> With all this open spaces and the windows and clarity and clean lines, some of us may feel you feel like you're living in a gold in a in a fishbowl as a goldfish. And then <clears throat> I'm sure most of us would find something like this, the night sky, a very aesthetic thing. So the point is aesthetics is very subjective. Aesthetics varies from person to person, therefore, <clears throat> but there are certain principles that we look at when we think of aesthetics. Sometimes it may just be a form of symmetry. And for many years, we've been taught symmetry equals aesthetics. Okay, but if we look at the definition of aesthetics as to what is aesthetics, one of the definitions is that it's a set of principles concerned with the nature and appreciation of beauty. If something is aesthetic, we find it appealing and beautiful. Okay, <clears throat> and it looks with beauty and artistry. And we as dentists are artists. And that is why for me, I find it personally very intriguing that we have to have a, a, a theme or a topic such as aesthetic dentistry, almost as though any other, you get unesthetic dentistry. You know, you may get it, but it's not what you strive for. So if I call myself an aesthetic dentist and you don't, does that mean you're a dentist that operates on giving function and everything looks crap? I doubt it. If you go to a patient and say, I'm going to do a filling for you, it's going to be the most solid filling you ever chewed on, but it's going to look like some dog food. They're not going to want to pay you for it. So in my personal opinion, anything we do in dentistry <clears throat> has to be aesthetic. And being functional does not, and having functionality and having aesthetics does not make things mutually exclusive from each other. You must have function and you must have aesthetics. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. This is a young dentist, um, Dr. Kavir Rutten, <clears throat> sent me these pictures. And you can see, I don't know, can you guys see my little cursor? I'm just going to check because I'm going to use it for a bit. Can you see the little arrow pointing at the cavity there? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so there's a cavity there. And as a dentist, you would prepare the cavity and you would restore it. But the idea is not to restore it to the picture above here in the top of the big. You need to restore it to the picture on the right because you want it to look like a natural tooth. And there are techniques that we have with it. You call it stamping or whatever where you can actually develop that and give that to a patient. And a patient is going to be more willing to part with their money when you give them that than if you give them something on the top. And therefore, I think everything we do, even as a periodontal practice, I, I realize more and more, even if I'm putting an implant in and it's in the bone and I'm not the one restoring it, I need to make sure that we can give the patient good aesthetics. 
because that is part of the responsibility we have. Does anybody know who this gentleman is in the middle of this picture? Ignore the guy on the left. The guy on the right is Howard Gluckman, <clears throat> one of my mentors. Anybody want to hazard a guess who this guy in the center of the picture is? Come in. Time impress me, guys. I need to be impressed by Zimbabwe. Just type it in if we can have a text. Christian Kochman. Yes, who's that? Can I get your name, please? I want this to be a little bit more interactive. I know it's online, it's very difficult, but I like it more interactive. Who, who, who gave me the answer there? It's Dr. Six. Yeah, doctor. Doctor? Dr. Sixpence. Six I, I thought I heard Dr. Sixpence. I'm sure that was not right. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <clears throat> I hope that's not your value because your value has just gone up if, you, if, if they think of you as Dr. Sixpence. Um, you're right. That's Christian Coachman. And what is Christian Coachman known for? What you, philosophy you is he? Uh, digital smile designing 100 you my star student here tonight digital smile <laughs> design as i'm um, as most have most of you heard of this term yes no who ha who hasn't just put a tick or whatever i don't know because i don't know if i want to go into detail with it or not if many of you know about all of this who's heard, who's not heard of digital smile design Just put it in chat, just say me. Okay. Okay, Dr. Vicky, thank you. Thank you for, <clears throat> you see, don't be shy to say you don't know. Because if you don't know and you don't say it, then we're not gonna explain it. And then you're not gonna understand it. Okay, thank you. So thank you for all those who say they don't know. And then I'm feeling <clears throat> more encouraged because at least we're not, I'm gonna have at least three people who feel that they've learned something from my, my talk. So digital smile design is an important concept and it has revolutionized my way of practicing with regards to implant dentistry and with regards to my periodontal practice. Um, we had the luxury, Christian Coachman is actually in the Guinness Book of Records <clears throat> because he is a sixth generation dentist, which I feel sorry for his kids or his brother's kids because there's a lot of pressure on him to continue that streak, I suppose. But he's also most probably a speaker under correction, but I think he's the most expensive speaker in the world. But the Implant and Aesthetic Academy, who I am involved with, was fortunate enough to bring him into South Africa in February of this year. So about two months ago, he came to Cape Town and he presented a two-day DSD course. And I will encourage all of you to go and do it. He offers online courses as well. <clears throat> and we have some people in, we have the only trainer in Africa in Cape Town, Dr. Mark Bowes as well. But anyway, I'll get back to that in a bit more detail. So digital smile design. Mm, why is my cursor not moving? Okay. So when we deal with aesthetics for many years, we've been taught, and I'm sure some of you still practice like that, that you must look at the smile, and you must work on golden proportions or various ratios of the teeth. And that's how you determine the smile. The problem with that approach from an aesthetic point of view is when you do it proportionally or you have symmetry, like you must have symmetry between left and right and all that. The problem is that often you get an unnatural smile like these guys, you know, and you may think that looks good, but to me, that doesn't look good. And it's not just the color, it's the natural look. If people look at you, like you all know Jurgen Klopp, I'm assuming football manager on the left, people know it's got a fake. That's not his natural teeth. What we are trying to achieve as dentists here is we want people to have a beautiful smile, but we want when, they, when people look at them, they cannot tell that that is not their own smile that they were born with. So let's look at this <clears throat> scenario, for example. If we look at the smile, and remember we taught like the old way of teaching that we've got to look at the smile and the, you know, we, I remember we were taught like the lips are the framework of the smile. So you must look at the lips and look at the smile <clears throat> and we must have symmetry. Then I would say there's a lot wrong with the smile and it's not very aesthetic. For one, if we look at symmetry, 
Look how much gum she's showing on this side versus how much gingival tissue she's showing on this side. There's no symmetry there. Look at these two centrals. Can you see how they can't or tilt towards the, if I'm looking at the screen towards the left? If you look at this lateral, look how this one splays out a little bit compared to this one. Look how this two on this, this one four is tucked in more than the two four. So this is not, if I look at all those things and I'm being overly critical, I wouldn't look at this smile and say this is a very aesthetic smile, right? But if I look at the face, then all of a sudden I'm saying, hold on, that's a pretty woman. This is a famous actress. She's making a career from her looks. <clears throat> okay. So, and people don't look at a smile and say that's bad. And this is the essence of what DSD is telling us. DSD is saying to you, you cannot look at the mouth and the lips and the teeth. Do I have a question there? No. You have to look at the face because the mouth and the smile is part of the face and everything is in harmony with the face. So what DSD says is you plan the upper teeth for the ideal aesthetics related to the face to be in harmony. Then you go and look at whether the lower teeth can fit in with the top teeth, with occlusion. Then you look at whether you've got bone, if it's an implant that you're looking for, and so forth. But you start with that foundation. And as you know with navigation, you can only reach your destination if you know where you have to go. So you have to start off by understanding what is the ideal smile we are looking for for the patient that looks natural and beautiful. And then we try and work towards that. And that has been a game changer in my practice. <clears throat> so the facial proportions and the facial landmarks are critical in terms of identifying what is the smile that we're looking for. Now, symmetry, like I said, is not the most important thing. Because if you know, you remember, we, even our face is not symmetrical. Our one side is always slightly smaller than the other side. <clears throat> so this is also from Christian Kroetschmann's group with Carl Stanley, them where they showed that it's not so much important whether you have symmetry in your face, but whether you have a good facial flow. And what does that mean? So most people don't have a straight face, okay? <clears throat> Everything isn't aligned straight. So when you look at the patient, usually the face and the midline and the nose runs in a certain direction. Sometimes some people's noses tilt to one side or the other side. Sometimes they chin chin tilts to one side or the other side. And sometimes the teeth have a slope to one side or the other side. It's called the cant. Now, if the face, the nose, the chin, the teeth all have the same cant, so if they all tilt, but they tilt in the same direction, that is a harmonious facial flow. And your eye will look at that and will not pick that up as anesthetic. However, if the teeth are in a different plane, to what the face is or the nose is, then your eye will pick that up as anesthetic or picks up something's not right. You can't put your finger on it, but you just think this doesn't look right. So let's go again to Alexandra Daddario, this lady. Look at her. So if you look at this picture, her nose tilts a bit to the left as you're looking at it. But remember, her teeth are also tilted to the left and her chin also has a slight left cant. So therefore her face, is in facial flow harmony or balance. And therefore, when you look at a smile overall, even though she doesn't have symmetry between one side and the other side, because everything is in flow, it still looks like a beautiful natural smile. Let's look at this guy, one of my patients. <clears throat> this poor chap, look at him. His nose is tilting towards the right as I'm looking at it, but his teeth are tilting a bit towards the left. <clears throat> so if I look at it, like I said, it's not bad, but I look at it and I think something just doesn't look that good. And when I sent him for a DSD simulation and design, all they did is they made him a set of teeth and they gave the teeth all a little tilt. You can see if you look at these white teeth, they're all tilting a little bit to the left. And that left tilt is tilting the same direction as the nose and suddenly it doesn't look as noticeable. His smile looks better on the right than on the left. We haven't fixed his nose. We haven't given his straight teeth. In fact, if you look at his midline, look where his midline is. His midline is off the center. He doesn't have a midline in the center. But even the midline in the center is not so critical if you have a, a, a balanced facial flow. And this is part of the concepts of digital smile design and where you get natural look. 
So when you look at DSD, you can either do it on the app, which is on the left, you have to have an iPad because <clears throat> it's only on the Apple platform. Um, or you can do it via the Digital Smile Design Center, which is at www.digitalsmiledesign.com. The problem I just have to mention is the Smile Design Center, the one we would use is based in Spain. They used to be free, well, they used to be free to anybody to use. You obviously pay for what you order, but because they have become in such demand, and they can't keep up with it, they no longer open to everybody. So if you want to use the center, you have to do the residency program, which is a three month online program <clears throat> that they have. I think they aren't, they're on, they started the third one now. It's quite intense. I did the first one. So you normally do one day a week for three months, um, for two hours, two to three hours, um, and very valuable. So once you do that course in for a year, you can use this, the planning center. Um, the nice thing with the planning center is they do the planning for you and then you just, and I'll show you how that works, and then you just have to approve it or not. Whereas if you do the app, and that is what like Dr. Mark Bose will teach you in one of his courses, he'll teach you how to use the app. Um, you can do your own planning and simulation and everything on the patient. And then you've got to convert the 2D, which is in 2D, you've got to convert that into 3D, and then you can show the patient the mock-up. So you log in, you sign up, you sign up is for free, <clears throat> and then you pay only for what you need to order. So let's start with this patient. I'm just going to show you two main cases that we do. So this this lady is Michelle Swatch. She was actually my first DSD case that I did. <clears throat> and she had just turned 50. This was two years ago. And she wanted, she was missing some posterior teeth. I'll show you now. But she wanted to show, uh, she wanted better looking front teeth. So what we do according to DSD, is, well, let me first just show you the clinical picture. So then you can see there's the top teeth. You'll see the teeth missing in the third quadrant, the first quadrant, the second quadrant. She had reta retained roots. And you can see occlusally this upper right molar, one six was terminal. So we knew we had to take that out. She was missing premolars in front of that. I think it was a one seven, sorry. <clears throat> she was missing a lower molar and she had a retained root here and missing some more teeth here. So what we do according to DSD is DSD tells you, you have to take five photos and a video at the very least. And the photos you take, you don't take with a high definition SLR camera or anything like that. You take them with this device over here, your iPhone. <clears throat> That's what you need to use, okay? Now you take a photo, frontal photo at rest, frontal photo at maximum smile, and you get a smile called the decayed smile where you have these little crow's feet on the eyes, the wrinkles that appear. That's the proper smile. Most people don't give it to you. You take a side profile from the profile of your lateral shift, relaxed and in maximum smile. And then you take what they call the 12 o'clock position. That's when the patient looks down with the head, tilts the eyes up and gives you a broad smile to see where the incisal edge lines up with the lip. And then the last thing you do from these things is you take a 30 second video that tries to show all these views. And why do you do that? The reason for that is because they will take, they say one second of a video is something like 30 uh, individual photos you get from that one slide, second. And what they do is they will isolate the frames and they will choose the frames from the photo because when a patient gives a smile to a video, they will give a broader smile than when you ask the patient to smile for a photo. And if your photos that you're using as your reference are not accurate, then your end result is not going to be accurate. Because the problem is you're going to plan the, the smile based on these stills that they take, um, that you take of the patient. You plan this beautiful smile. They, you give the patient the teeth, and then the patient smiles in real life, and they, it doesn't look as good because they're showing more gum. Because everybody has a gummy smile, actually, they've shown in real life. I think it's something like 80-odd percent of people actually have a gummy smile. Most people just cover it up. So that's the video that we take from the patient and we ask some questions and we just talk to her, make a joke if you can so that you can smile, tickle her if you have to, just make sure you just only tickle her above the waist, joking. Um, but the whole idea is to get the patient to do natural appearances. Once you've taken these records, ideally you would take an intraoral scan if you've got a digital scanner and you take a cone beam scan. If you're going to plan implants, you have to do that. And you take all of that, 
you log into your account on the site. This is now obviously if you're not using the app, you're using the center, and they will tell you here how to. Sorry, is my is my photo in the way of this picture, or is it just for me that it's in the way? Can somebody just on, uh, respond to me? I've got my picture here on the screen of my video of me, so I don't know. It's overlapping this picture on the top right. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so it's very straightforward. They show you the five photos, the videos. They give it to you step by step how you put it in, um, and you can do that. It shows you front, facial frontal smile, facial frontal rest. You can see profile and so forth. Step by step, you would load up your scan models. If you don't have an intraoral scanner, for example, and you want to use them and you know a colleague who's got one, you can take an Algen or you've got a lab who has one. You can take a conventional impression, alginate impression, cast the model, and they can scan the model and send that too. But obviously, it's better if you have an intraoral scan. So you load all of this up. Then you go to the shop section here and <clears throat> up until now you haven't paid everything anything they will even store it for you on their cloud based the patient's records there for free you put it up under your profile and you can have load as many patients as you want to okay <clears throat> and then you get to the position now these prices are all in euro and these prices are about two years old so and they've gone up significantly especially like this interdisciplinary was 375 and it's gone up to over 800 euro now so it's expensive to give you an idea, to do a upper and lower um, planning and a motivational mock-up will cost the patient roughly about 10,000 Rand <clears throat> is what will cost him to get that. So what we do is you can then choose just to have an upper planning. You can do an upper and lower planning, or you can do interdisciplinary. The difference is like, obviously upper is just upper, upper and lower is both. Did. Now be careful. You can't ask for an upper planning if it's going to change the teeth significantly because then your occlusion is going to be out. So you can't give the patient those nice upper teeth with those positioning of the teeth. And then because the lower teeth stayed the same, the bite is going to be out. So if you know you're going to change the bite significantly uh, or even insignificantly, if it's going to change in any way, you have to ask for an upper and lower planning, even if you're not going to use it all in the beginning, but so that it lines up. The DSD interdisciplinary is when you're going to do orthodontics with it and implants with it and all that. Because, but because it's so expensive, most of us have sort of bypassed the system. Those of us who've used it, we, we go and we just ask for, we, we first ask for an upper lower planning just to get the framework. And then we will do the, the implant planning or orthodontics as we want to. Or we will do the orthodontics first to correct the malalignment as much as possible. And once the teeth are lined up, then we go and do the DSD upper and lower planning. You can also, <clears throat> and we'll show a case of it, ask for a crown lengthening guide when you now, you based on your DSD and do your period analysis where they look at the, where the CEJ is, where the bone is, where the gingival tissues, and they measure it and they tell you how much reduction. And there's other stuff that you need, you can choose. You can choose crown guides to show you how much to prep and so forth. Obviously, everything costs money, <clears throat> but it's all to guide you. Now let's get back to Michelle. So what we do is we've taken our photos, we've sent it off and I've asked them to do me an upper and lower DSD planning. They look at her facial profile, the landmarks, and they give me a smile design. Now, when they give me a smile design, they give it to me three different models. Two of the models are pink in color and one is blue. So this is what it looks like. So you can see on the left here, the furthest left, the first pink model is called the ideal pretreatment. So what they've done here is they've taken the teeth that they have looked at, the size, shape, width to her face that they think is the ideal. And these are dentists doing this planning that have been trained. Like I said, you can do it yourself, but it's going to take you a while to get to that level of experience and skill. But they plan the teeth and they just stick the teeth over where her existing teeth are. And where the pink shows through, it means that if I want to put that veneer or that crown on, I'm going to have to reduce that surface of that tooth in order for it, because the tooth is protruding beyond where the crown must be or the veneer must be. Okay. I hope you all understand that. The blue model is just the model where it assumes you've done all the reduction and where the teeth are. This right side is just the occlusal view. So it shows you, like you can see where the whole tooth is covered, it means I don't actually have to cut that tooth down. I can do an onlay bonding. Sorry. <clears throat> I can onlay bond. 
I have to use my mouse pad in this. Anyway, um, and where it's, so, and where it's pink is showing through occlusally means I'm going to have to do occlusal reduction to give me enough fixed space there to have the crown done. Then they will also look at whether you need to open the bite and they will show you here by how much. Now, what you must understand, remember when you have prosthetic space, for those of you <clears throat> going back to the basics is, so prosthetic space is the amount of space you have for the actual crown of the tooth, right? Between the gingival margin and the opposing tooth occlusion. Now, if you don't have enough prosthetic space for the tooth, then you can create prosthetic space by three ways. You can either do it by cutting away tooth structure so that you cut away tooth structure and then you're giving yourself now space to put in a crown or veneer. But remember, there's a limit to how much you can cut down because you're going to end up in a pulp chamber. Alternatively, you can do it orthodontically where you can intrude or extrude a tooth. And that's, but that's also time consuming and extensive. Or the third option is you can open the bite. And people have opinions on how much you can open the bite, and that's a different discussion, but <clears throat> they believe you can open the bite as much as you want to, but at least up to five millimeters, depending on the, 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 the jaw relationship with the patient. So the only case where you've really got to be worried about opening the bite too much are in class two patients, because when you open the bite, if you look at it like that, when you open the bite, the mandible moves down and backwards. So if the patient's class three and you move down and backwards, you can actually more or less get into a class one. If they're class one and down and backwards within reason, you can stay in a class one tending to class two. But if they're in a class two already and you move down and backwards, you can aggravate that class two. But this shows you how much you can do that. And then the third model, which is, which is the second pink model they give you is the motivational mock-up. <clears throat> and this is a very important one. So what they do here is they take the teeth in the planning. This is an illusion because they take the teeth that they have designed for the patient and they place it about two millimeters buckle of where it should be. And the idea for that is you take those teeth and you just stick them on, just spot bond them onto the patient's existing teeth. And then you take a video of the patient. And I can tell you this sells treatment like nothing else because you do get smile design programs. There's one called SmileFi, which is much cheaper now where you do it digitally and you can show the patient on an iPad what they can look like. That doesn't mean as much to a patient because they're seeing on a screen. But you stick something in their mouth and show them a mirror and a video and let them look at their smile and you haven't done anything. You haven't prepped the teeth. You haven't touched them. And I'll show you examples. And that patient sees it. It blows their mind and they, can, they want it. Because your problem is when you're trying to convince a patient for treatment, you may visualize it. But the patient cannot visualize. They're not dentists, firstly. Secondly, the big problem, and I've seen this time and time again in my years of experience, <clears throat> patients only realize the end result the day you fit their crowns or their veneers or whatever. And like I said at the beginning, aesthetics is subjective. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You may think, wow, that looks amazing. And the patient looks, meh. And I spent all this money for that. That's not the smile I want. Because, and you only find out then, the beauty of DSD is the patient can see what they can look like before you even touch them. And if they like, if they don't like it, you can change it and show it to them again. And if they like it, you have a blueprint template that you can follow. Christian calls it cut and paste dentistry. You can do it cut and paste it. Everything follows exactly so that you give them what, they, what you've shown them. Okay. And the motivational mock-up is the, is, is the main one. Okay, and this is what he says, this is where the magic happens, like Christian Coachman says. So let's give you an example. Now, I'll show you a video of Michelle between when we saw her first and when we did her motivational mock-up. And the time frame between those two videos is 30 days. It takes about two to three weeks to get it back, especially if customs holds it up. <clears throat> so it's not a long time because you'll say, no, she changed stuff and all this. So this is how it comes in a box, the magic box. You can either, so they give you a 3D printing of the teeth. <clears throat> you can either get shells like this, which you stick on. This was the first case we did, so we went with this, which actually costs more, and I wouldn't recommend it. Or you can get them to do a silicone index like this, which is what I would recommend. It's cheaper, and the thing, the beauty of this is you, you flow in your pro temp or whatever you're going to use temporary crown material, um, and you stick it on the teeth, and they can show them. 
it's a bit more of a pain because you've got to flick it off and <clears throat> you've got to look carefully because you leave stuff behind. But the nice thing is with these ones, if this breaks like here in the middle, it becomes even more difficult to work with. Whereas if something breaks here, you just take another mold or if it doesn't set. So you can reuse it over and over again. <clears throat> and when you're doing temps and you're prepping the teeth, you can use this for the temps of the patient. So here's Michelle. So you can see we've just stuck it on the front of her teeth, not done anything to her teeth. Okay. There you can see, just stuck on the front. It does feel a bit funny for the patient because the teeth stand a bit further forward. But like I said, it's just an illusion to show the patient. And then we take the video. Do not show the patient the teeth when you put them in on the mirror first. You first stick them on, you take a video, you then put the two videos side by side, the old one that you've taken, <clears throat> the new one, the mock-up, the motivational mock-up, and you show them. And here she is. Okay. Look at the difference. So she, like I said, um, 30 days between these two videos, nothing else has been done. Okay, maybe this picture is just a little, on the right is a little bit more zoomed in, but she loved it. So now she sees that and she says, wow, this is amazing. That's what I want. I like that. Now we've got a place to start from and we haven't touched her. Now she's willing to part with more money because she sees that's what I want. And it's not the only one. Look at this case. So this is a lady, a old, a long standing patient of mine. This one three is an implant done by an, another maxillofacial surgeon. <clears throat> and, the and the implant goes into the, to, to the floor of the nose, it's actually five millimeters in, but it's well integrated. You know what they say about implants? How do you make sure an implant integrates well? You put it in badly. That's the one that will stick like you won't believe. Anyway, so he placed this implant for her. I tried to do some soft tissue augmentation like 10 years plus ago. We did a little bit, but over the years, the gums receded again. And she said to me, Doc, I don't like this. Can you fix this? Look how this looks and look there. So I said to her, look, my dear, I can't pull that gum down. Not going to happen. No way. I'm even the best periodontist in the world. Not do it. But I noticed you grind and your other teeth have worn down quite a bit. Why don't we do a motivational mock-up and see with DSD if we give you longer teeth, whether it looks better. And this is the one on the right. Just didn't do anything with it, just stuck it on. Look at the difference. That's look, she's giving my husband and he's looking at me like, you're going to make me pay for this now, you bloody bugger. And not perfect, but it makes a big difference. Look at this one. This is a farmer whose daughter is getting married and obviously his wife drags him to the dentist. He needed two implants at the bottom. So it's not my work. And she said, you better look better for the wedding photos of your daughters. <clears throat> so that's what he looks like beforehand. We do the motivational mock-up, send it to the DSD center. They just stick it onto his teeth and we take the video and that's what he looks like. Big difference. All right. And you can see, and the patient sees that. Okay. So now Michelle decides that's what she wants. Why is it important for me? Because I'm placing implants and I'm placing implants at the back. So what do I care what the teeth look like? I care because the position of those teeth need to match the position of her final teeth. Because in order to have the space filled properly, even if they're building veneers onto those front teeth, it's going to impact on the size, the width, the proportions of the back teeth. And remember, I can't move an implant. So I need to make sure my implant is in the center. So this is what we now do. <clears throat> so now we go to the DSD. This is, a, this is an interdisciplinary planning. And you can see... Notice here, so this is the pink model. So it's a pre-op plan. There's a route. I'll show you them both at the same time. The top is the top one. The bottom was the bottom planning. So you can see there's a route there first. So what they do digitally, the planning center does. Nowadays, we do this ourselves. We don't use them just to save costs for the patient. We extract that tooth. Okay. We did at the top. We did at the bottom, this root remnant at the bottom as well. <clears throat> you can see once we extract the tooth, you'll see they will change the position that the, the model will change to blue because what they now do is they superimpose the final teeth that the patient wants. See how the bottom one is turned blue and there the top turns blue too. That's what the final teeth are going to be with the position. And now we go and we plan our implants in the center of those final teeth, not her current teeth, the final teeth, the width, and the size that they do to show what <clears throat> we want it to look like. And it's all predictable. Once I've achieved that, because remember, it's cut and paste. So I, want, I don't want any guesswork. 
I want to know that I'm going to end up with that result. What we then do is, so I'll just fast forward to this. We now go with our surgical guide and we do guided surgery. <clears throat> so this is the um, R2 gate system for Megagen, one of the implant systems we use. So what they've done, they, on that extra computer simulation you've seen, we put in the implants in position. This is where my cone beam came in and they overlapped it. They now go and they mill or print a guide for those implants in that position. I then have a specific guided surgical kit and I like this one. Some have a spoon, some of this where this, you've got this neck portion of the drill which is thick so it slides into that sleeve. And what it does is it force me, forces me to put the implant in that sleeve and I can only drill in that direction. And then there's a little lip over here and there's a lip you can see here at the top of the guide and that lip will stop on this lip so that I only get to that depth. So my position, angulation, my depth is predetermined. <clears throat> so you can see there it's resting on her existing teeth and I drill through and I cannot put it, I mean, I can give it to my assistant to put this implant in, not that I would, but technically, because she can only put it in that direction, provided that this guide is secure and it works well. And then I take the implant and I drive the implant in. And again, it goes in only one direction. And to make sure that I'm in the end position that I wanted, that I planned it, this little line on top must line up with the top of this sleeve. And this little goal window Goal strip must line up in the window once that line is level with, with the top of this. And if I do that, then I've got my implants in the exact position that I've planned them. Okay. <clears throat> so now I come to another aspect or concept with regards to aesthetics. So once we've had the implant integrated, or if I've got good primary stability, we put on healing abutments, right? <clears throat> But what you must remember is soft tissue management is as important as hot tissue management. As placing that implant in the right position in the bone, the gum or the soft tissue you have around there is as critical as developing that. And these customized, um, these conventional healing abutments don't really work for us anymore. We've moved on from that. This is not something I want to see. <clears throat> and I see it all the time, especially from axillofacial surgeons. And if I can teach you one thing today, this is not right. Forget the pus, that's beside the point. This is done by maxillofacial. This is a molar tooth that's got a fitting over here. What an exposure of an implant is not so that you can see where the implant is. An exposure is to create enough of an emergence profile for you to fit a tooth into there that it comes out of the gum looking like a natural tooth and there's enough space of the gum. That is not going to be achieved in many cases by putting in a round healing abutment. And why is that? Because if we look at teeth, remember, teeth in cross-section are not round. There's no tooth that's round in cross-section. If you're looking at your anterior teeth, they're more triangular. If you're looking in the premolar teeth, they're more oval in shape. And if you look at your molar teeth, they're more squarish or rhomboid in shape. The other important thing is if you're going circular and you have this healing abutment, and I now want to go wider because I've got too much gum tissue interproximally, the problem with the circle is the, the increase in dimension in, because of the radius in this dimension is automatically going to increase that way. So I'm not going to have enough tissue for this edge. So what I need to have here is more of an elliptical tooth. I don't have a circular tooth. And that doesn't, I don't get that with a conventional healing abutment. And therefore people have developed customized abutments and one of the systems we use, I'll show you now called the cervical. Because if you don't do it properly, this is what you get. This is nonsense. I'm not even talking about the color. This is called the pelican technique, I say. Because that patient's gonna have a gullet there that half their food's gonna stay in there. And that patient's gonna think that implant is the worst thing they ever did. Because this surgeon did not focus on managing the soft tissue and you think, but it's a back tooth. It's, I don't need to worry about aesthetics. Aesthetics is important, even in the back. Because if that gum is not in the right position, it doesn't just look badly. It's going to have functional issues. And then Sun Tzu in 2010 proposed the critical contour, subcritical contour concept. And this is another very important aspect if you're doing implant dentistry. Well, Alberta Masali, then we refer to it. Some people refer to it as the umbrella concept. So what do we mean by that? 
if you look at my cursor and you see where this area is, let's imagine this whole rectangular thing is the implant. And that's the platform of the implant. Generally, how many people still restore the implant is they take the, the crown and from the platform of the implant, they flare it out, right? That's what we do. We flare it out. That is not the right way to do it because what you're doing by flaring it out is you're pushing all this tissue away from lying over the implant. And if you do that, the tissue recedes because there's no space. It is better to have this space filled with tissue because the tissue over here gives you better volume, makes it more resilient and actually protects the implant. So what Sun Tzu said is the critical contour is the first millimeter below the free gingival margin. And he said that you, that is the only part where you create the flare of the emergence profile. The sub section below that millimeter, millimeter and a half to the implant platform is called the subcritical contour. And ideally that should be as much, give as much space for tissue as possible. So you actually want an implant restoration that looks like a tulip, like a stalk, where it's narrow here and then flares out just before, because that will actually give you a better aesthetic result that is more stable. Obviously, if you have too much tissue and you need to bulk it out, then you can add on to that critical contour. And I'll show you an example of it to push it, the gum down to make it recede. So you develop the tissue. But it's an important concept to understand, not just from functionality and protection of the implant, but also because of acidics. So this is the cervical system. So you'll see over here, it comes like this. There are molars, there's premolar shapes, there's anterior shapes, triangular, there's uh, ovoid molars. And then if you want to go for circular ones, because they've got to give you a choice of circular ones. So what you do is you choose the shape that you want for that site. And then you have little wheel and you can put a temporary in and you mold the a button. You make a customized button to that. I'm not going to go into detail of how it gets done. That's for another thing. Otherwise we'll be here. And I know you'll tired from work, from the day's work, but look at this. So here's an example. Look at these two. This is your con. It's two premolars. This is a conventional round healing abutment, and that's a customized cervical. Look at the emergence you've created here compared to here. Look how the tissue here even has on the buckle is standing out more than what it stands out here. So you have an augmented tissue, but you by it, just displacing that tissue, you've already given yourself a better profile. And that's just by choosing the right abutment. This is one I did with it's a molar. Because again, look how squarish this thing looks. Look at the nice shape when I take this off. That's what we want. <clears throat> now I want to show you this. I'm telling this is a case of mine. This was done, taken 15 years after I placed the implant. <clears throat> there is an implant somewhere in these anterior 12 teeth, top and bottom, between K9 and K9. One of these teeth is an implant. Please guess which one is the implant. Come, let's get some interaction again. You're falling asleep there. <laughs> Type in the chat box, please. Oops, I gave it away. <clears throat> Anybody, which one do you think is the implant? Uh, I'm gonna try and touch the chat button. Uh, okay, let's see, you got three. I'm gonna get a few guesses. <laughs> okay, let's see. The one, one, one Yeah, Ron, you looked at my picture too quickly. You <laughs> saw it. Thank you. At least no, Chingrena really. is being honest. It's the one, one you write. Why do you say the one, one, Ron? Why do I say the one, one? Yeah, why do you say the one, one is important? There's grayness well, showing through there. There's grayness showing through there. No, it's a, it's a gum tissue, the marginal gingiva. What's, on the one, one, that module diff tissue different to that one? Because the, the two one has got your more mm -hmm. natural pigmentation and the mm -hmm. one on the one you one is a bit lighter. No, fair so enough. It just gives the impression that <clears throat> something happened there. No, I agree. You're right. It is the one one. But what I want to, why I show you this case is, look at the x-ray. Look how the abutment looks. Look how narrow we have here. 
And then we get just below the free gingival margin. Look how high, that's high. That's like five millimeters. And then we have the crown. But what's significant about this? The patient has natural teeth here. Look even on the natural teeth with the post-core crowns, how the gingiva has receded. The gingival tissue has receded around natural teeth, which had gingival, dental gingival fibers running there. And yet it's receded. But around the implant, it hasn't receded. After 15 years, she, I got this because she came in for these implants at the bottom. And why is that? Because we've got that concept. This is before I even knew. This is before Sansu. So I did it by luck. But it shows when I look back, I say, he's right. Because I've created space for tissue to move in. It protects the implant. And that gives me long-term stability. And that design gives me a better aesthetics. So it's not just a functional thing. It's an aesthetic thing. So let's look at Michelle here. Now we're going to do Michelle, expose Michelle's implants. Look how narrow this ridge is over here. Look how little keratinized tissue we attach, keratinized tissue we have there. That's alveolar mucosa. That's keratinized tissue. So now what I would normally say is, oh, am I going to do a bone augmentation over here because I'm going to have to push this out and build it up? <clears throat> no, I use a customized abutment. Look how I've pushed this tissue out. Look how thick is that band of attached keratinized tissue there. It's got a heel. I've pushed it out just by means of tissue training, we call it, with the abutment. Okay. I make sure it's seated properly. You can see it's not seated properly there. And this is another critical thing, but I'm not going to go into the why you choose the height and there it's seated properly. Look at it now. Look on the other side here. We've got a premolar. This is my first case. We did, we did lots of mistakes here, <clears throat> but we learned. Um, and there's the molar shape. And look, this is about a week later. Look how that tissue is healed up there. Look how that band, look how, remember how collapsed that area was and that narrow reach with the touch career. Look how suddenly without doing an augmentation, I've managed to push that tissue out to heal it because I've used the customized abutment. Again, it's giving me aesthetics and giving me function using a technique. That is different to this. This is never going to give me a good result. Just by using the right tools and techniques. So that's Michelle. That's what we planned her for. I haven't seen her yet <clears throat> because I found the dentist up for this lecture. I said, where is Michelle? Have you finished Michelle? And he said, yeah, I finished a while back. I said, but I haven't seen any photos. That's the mock-up. And then he sends me the photos. He, he got in, but he didn't send me all the photos. And this is what Michelle looks like. I think we've met her brief. She wants nicer teeth, but look natural. Doesn't look like Jurgen Klopp's fake teeth. Natural. And look at the planning from year to year. And this is the dentist doing it for the first time. First time doing DSD. Didn't have training. His technician didn't have training. We just, and we bumped our heads and it wasn't perfect, but we still end up with a good result and close to what we planned. What about crown lengthening? We use DSD for crown lengthening as well. <clears throat> and how do we do that? Because now what happens is, remember, we have planned the shape and the size of the teeth, but now we need to take away some gingival tissue. There's too much, but we're not going to take away Willie in the lead. Not, Ron's not going to cut away what he feels is good. And if Ron had a fight with his partner that day, he's going to take away more. And if she was good to him, he's going to take away less because he's in a good mood. It doesn't work like that. It's all predicted, right? So when we look at these guides, this is what they look like, because this little window is where we trim the gingiva too, that little margin is where we trim the bone to give, to give us the biological zone space. It's all pre-planned. So I'll show you this case. And I'll show you again a beautiful aspect here. And this is a case done by Dr. Mark Bose, who's the only, like I said, DSD instructor in Africa. <clears throat> okay. And this lady came and you can see she had this crown and she had these teeth and there was too much gum. So she wanted a better smile. Not that her smile looks bad here, but she wanted a better smile. So I showed this case because he did it on the app. So he's well experienced and versed and skilled. So he can do that. He plans it on the app. He shows the before and he shows the after. He now plans the guide, the DSD guide, clinical crown lengthening guide based on the teeth that he's done. So it's exactly to the planned teeth. They then go and they put it on. You can see there's the window for trimming the tissue. Then they trim the bone. They suture it back with 6-0 suture. We have to only use 6-0 suture. It's called this microsurgery. And they stick it on. And there's the crowns from there to there. 
Look at the difference. Look at this beautiful smile that she's got. Now, did you notice anything? Do you notice anything significant or different on this lady's smile? Come on, let's see how sharp you are now. Anybody? <clears throat> what do you notice that doesn't look normal about her smile? I'll ask it that way. I'll go back. Sorry. Let's look here. Do you notice anything normal here about the teeth? Give it even more clue. That doesn't look conventional. Anybody? Yes, it's fine. I'm just see if you notice anything. Hi, Bradley. Hi, Ron. Uh, you mean apart from the length of the teeth? Yeah, apart from the length of the teeth. Something that looks different from what you normally would have for a tooth. There's one tooth that doesn't look like it normally should look here. Which tooth is that? Yeah, that's the lateral. Uh, yes. The lateral, Which lateral? incisor. Look one at this tooth. one yeah, tooth. Yeah, it looks like a look canine. At, look, it looks like a canine. Yeah. Look here. This one looks more like a lateral. This was her natural teeth too. Look there. That yeah. is the lateral. Her net. Only this. Only the one one is a crown. That's her natural tooth that looks like a lateral. That lateral looks like a canine. So again, talking about symmetry, proportions, whatever, we would tell ourselves, I've got to make this lateral look like a canine, right? I've got to flatten that incisal edge. But they didn't do that. They kept it exactly the way it looked in her mouth. And did that make her smile look any less natural? Look how beautiful that smile looks. You didn't pick up that this lateral looked like a canine when you looked at this lady's smile. That's the beauty of DSD. It makes it look natural. So I'll show you this case. This is my case. And this lady, she actually happened to be at school with my wife. I, well, I didn't know that at the time she was referred by dentist. Her name is uh, Emma. And Emma had a gummy smile. But Emma didn't not want a gummy smile. She said to us, guys, I want a gummy smile. I like my gummy smile. It's part of me. But I want my teeth to be a little bit bigger, to look a little bit better. But I don't want horse looking teeth. <clears throat> so what we did is we did a DSD. We gave it to the center and said, this is the brief we want. We don't want it to look too big, but we, we still want a bit of a gummy, but not as much. Can you give it? And this is the mock-up. We have just stuck it on the teeth. And I actually thought she's going to say, no, I want more. She actually said, I love it. That's exactly what I want. Again, you see, it's subjective. To me, to you, you'd say, no, man, I can give you longer teeth, less gum. She wanted a gummy smile. She just wanted the teeth a bit better. She was happy with that. Okay. And she's smiling <clears throat> with that. So now we know that is the reference point that we work from. The problem, and you can see this, remember I showed you this picture, Emma's face was in facial harmony. So Emma initially came to me because the dentist center, we were going to do crown lengthening and we were going to plan the crown lengthening based on this and we got the mock-up and she was happy. We then got a little bit of a curveball, and the curveball was this. Emma developed internal resorption of the 1-1. One, one. Look at that. Look on, this is the intraoral scan I took. Look at the discoloration of that tooth. So now we've got to take a tooth out and it's a central. So now I've got a situation where I've got to take this tooth out. I've got to do crown lengthening to make it look. And I've shown already what it looks like. And she wants it like that, but I've got a tooth that's now got to come out and I've got to put an implant in and she's still going to want that expectation. Now I've got a headache. What do I do now? What would you do here, Ron? Do you, would, is there any particular technique you would use for this implant in this scenario? I'm not putting you on the spot, my friend. I'm just asking. <clears throat> no, that's fine. Um, well, I think here you may want to do the, the pit. Yes. Well, you, you, we would do the socket shield. Socket shield, yeah. Because partial extraction therapy is a group of different things. You could do pontic shields or that, but socket shield. Or, remember, is there anybody yeah. here who does not know what socket shield is? 
I just want to know if I need to explain a little bit more or if we can, I know we're running out of time. I don't have, I've got about 10 more minutes to go. But I want, I don't want you to lose the concept. Let's just see, please explain. Okay. <clears throat> so what happens is when we, when we used to do implants, we used to take out the tooth. Remember, we used to wait for the bone to heal. And then we used to put an implant in. We then discovered that when you do that, the bone shrinks, the bone collapses, there's atrophy of the bone. You all know that. <clears throat> and that led to immediate implant placement where they thought, take the tooth out and put the implant in at the same time. We then discovered when we do that, the bone still shrinks, especially in the anterior maxilla. And the reason for that is because the studies have been done that show the buccal plate in 90% of people is less than a millimeter thick. So it's very little bone there on the buccal plate. Secondly, you've heard, if you've heard of the bundle bone theory, what that means is the bone on the buccal plate actually belongs to the tooth. In other words, it's the tooth, the periodontal ligament space of the tooth that supplies blood to that buccal plate. And the minute you remove the tooth, even if you do an immediate implant placement, that bone doesn't get blood supply and it collapses. And then the clever guys, Schompas or Marcus Herzl of them, developed the socket shield technique where what they do is you take the root of a tooth and you trim it away. So you take away most of the tooth and you leave about a millimeter and a half of the buccal piece of the root of the tooth behind. Okay, and you then put the implant inside of that. And when you do that, because you kept that little shell of tooth behind, obviously that piece of root mustn't be cracked, fractured and it mustn't be mobile. But if it's not fractured mobile and you keep that little piece, that piece will ensure that the implant, the bone does not collapse and you have beautiful aesthetics and nothing. I can tell you now, I've been doing it for years, nothing that you can do can give you the results that a socket shield can give you. <clears throat> and I'll give you an example. This was the case that brought it home for me. So if I show you this case, there's an implant there that's been in there. When the photo was taken, the implant had been in there for six years. Where's the implant? Come on, Ron. I think the others are shy. You and me will have a, a dialogue here. <clears throat> Uh, well, I want to give others a chance here to just... No, no, I'm happy with others. Them. One, two. Um, yes, Dr. Mandisha, 100%. And Tenda, you guys are all right. No, Gerald, you can't just say lateral. <laughs> I want to be more specific. One, two. That is where... Uh, sorry. The implant is. That, and that was an immediate implant placement. But now I'm going to say to you, there's another implant in there. Where is the second implant? The second implant is five years old. So there's a year between the two implants. One is six years old, one was five years old. Where is the other one? One, one. Kamandishi, thank you. Any other guesses? I was going to see a couple to see if he's the only one that's right or wrong. Anybody else? <clears throat> two, one. One, one. I've got one, one. I've got two, one. Okay. Thank you. The other implant, and the only difference between the two is the second one I use, besides, okay, I use a different implant make, but that's not the main point. I, use, I came, I discovered socket shield, and I use socket shield and I'll show you. The second one is the tutu. Now look at that picture guys. That is, and this is after five, minimum of five years. That is mind blowing. That that little piece of root can make such a difference. And people go on about the naysayers, yeah, socket shield, the root's gonna become infected and it's gonna be a problem, whatever. To me that, that is not really an argument because even if that root became infected and I have to remove it, my alternative is to end up looking like that. So why not give this a chance? Because when it works, it works brilliantly. And I have done hundreds of these 
and they work. And I'll show you. <clears throat> and this is what a socket shield looks like. That's not a crack. That's just blood over there. So that's the root. And there's a way we trim it down and we, and we teach these techniques. And you put the implant inside of that and palatally, and then you can fill that up with um, some bone material if you want, the space, the jump gap. And then you put connect, you can put soft tissue. So I have a question here. Thanks. <laughs> Tommy, thank you. <clears throat> but I, I won't take credits for this. This is between God and the patient. I just put the stuff in and the guys who developed the technique. It's 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 brilliant for us <clears throat> that, that, that this technique. But this shows you, and it's important to understand because here again is another concept that is another curve, um, bow uh, arrow in my quiver that allows me to manage a case to give me better aesthetics in implantology for a case that I need to do. So that's what we did with Emma. I did the crown lengthening. And remember, it was the one one. But now here's the problem. <clears throat> she comes back, she's got the crown lengthening done. You can see teeth are longer. But now I've got too much tissue over here. And I send it to the dentist. So the dentist says, look, this is a bit shorter. So I say to the dentist, yes, I know that. But remember Sun Tzu's technique? His point was you get the critical contour and the subcritical contour. So now we're operating in the critical contour, the millimeter, millimeter and a half below the free margin. And I say to the dentist, all I want you to do is slowly add composite, bulk it out more. Because remember, when we add composite on there, the gum is going to recede. And that's what the dentist did. She listened to me. And look where we are now. From there to there. I didn't have to go cut away gum tissue and do more surgery and put sutures in. We just trimmed it down. If we had too little gum tissue, then I would have had to take a connective tissue graft, something like this, out of harvested from the palate or the retromolar site, which is better if I can, and we would sandwich it underneath there and bulk it out. Uh, okay. I don't think there's a question. Eh? <clears throat> Um, just to show you what we would have done. But okay, so here's Emma. There's where she started. This is not the mock-up. This is her with her temps. Look at that implant. Look how nice that looks. I couldn't have achieved that with anything other but a soccer shield. And this is her temps, so they're not the finished product. And the dentist sent me, this is a picture she sends of a dentist. This week she said, look how I love my smile. Again, we have met the brief of the patient because she told us what we wanted to, what she wanted. She wanted a gummy smile, but she wanted bigger teeth, not too big. We tested it in a mock-up to show her, is that what you want? She said to us, yes, that's what I want. So we knew that was our reference that we could follow. And then even though we had a curveball of a, a, tooth that, a front tooth that had to go, we had other techniques that could help us to still give her the end result that we wanted in the acidics. And it can apply to other stuff as well, okay? I mean, this is just like we patient have recession, we can tunnel technique, connected tissue graft. Once we know it, we suture it up, and then we can go from something like that. This is a year later. You can see it's the same tooth. Look at the teeth overlap. Sorry, this was at my satellite clinic, so I didn't have my photos with me, and she came to my practice. Look how nice that gum looks there. Sorry. I'm nearly done, guys. Got a picture. These are all things we can offer. Socket shield versus GBR. Socket shield will beat GBR hands down every day of the week, including Sundays. <clears throat> GBR is the technique you use if you cannot do a socket shield. Because socket shield, like I said, there are very specific criteria for socket shield. Sorry, the question was, Socket shield versus GBR, please comment. So GBR for those who don't, and you get with GBR, you get, I would say we would talk more specific, not GBR. So GBR is where we use bone and we just pack bone in there, in that jump gap. Let me go back if I can to this picture. <clears throat> Sorry. So GBR is where, let's say we've got a big, we don't have the tooth here, we got this big gap and we pack bone in. The problem with GBR is because remember that blood supply is severed the minute you take this piece of tooth out. Even if you pack bone, it will give you volume, but you will still lose some volume. And it's unpredictable how much volume you will lose, number one. 
There is uh, Dennis Tana of them went and spoke about dual zone therapy. That is where they took the Jeep, the bone material, and they didn't just put it in the socket. They stuck it right up to the top of the ground free gingival margin. They sometimes add the Agnini brothers to talk about surgical veneer grafting, where they add soft tissue in there as well with it. And they bulk the teeth out. And yes, you can get some results that look amazing with that. I'm not saying you won't, but if you do, if you have 10 cases with GBR, you must probably get six to seven cases where it looks great. If you have 10 cases with socket shield and you do it right, you'll have 10 cases where it looks great. If it's work, if you've done it the right way and it's worked. So GBR is the second prize. Socket shield is the first prize. So if you can do a socket shield, learn the technique, that's the technique we use. If, but you need to know GBR because if you can't do a socket shield, then you have to do a GBR. Okay, and if you, sorry, somebody's asking a question again. Sorry. <clears throat> no, they're not. Okay. So if you'll indulge me just for one, for 30 seconds, I've only discussed some of the stuff here. <clears throat> I'm part of a group called the Implant and Aesthetic Academy. I'm very proud to be part of this group. It's run by Dr. Howard Gluckman in Cape Town. He's got an amazing practice and he's, was probably, in my opinion, the best periodontist in Africa. Um, and we offer courses. And these are just the courses for this year. Crown lengthening, orthodontics, basic implantology, immediate implants, advanced restorative model. There's Dr. Mark Bose, style Italiano is a, is a restorative. So you can choose if you want to do restorative only, how to do the stamp technique to make the crowns look like, the, the restorations look like natural restorations how you do, if you want to do surgical, how to do that soft tissue techniques that we do. We teach this all <clears throat> at these courses. It's a two-day course, usually on a Friday and Saturday. You can fly overseas, and I can tell you, even if you go overseas, there are a few places that will compare. And I'm not, and I am a bit biased, but I've been to these courses overseas, and I've looked at them, and I've done here. You'll be hard-pressed to find something that compares with what they offer you here, and this is on your doorstep. You have it. If you're interested in it, this is the lady <clears throat> you can speak to. They're not cheap. I think a two-day course is usually about 15, 15 and a half thousand rand. But if you're paying in dollars, it's going to be more expensive for the conversion. Um, Laura is the lady who runs the courses. You're welcome to take her details down. You're welcome to contact her, ask for a program. If you're interested, you see it. And I, I don't think Dr. Kaibi is here, Macbul, because he, it's, I know it's the holy night for the Muslim guys and they're fasting. <clears throat> But he's on the group. Once you come to the academy and you're part of the group and you become a co you, you attend the course, you go onto a WhatsApp group, you form part of the community, and you can put any question on the group. And nobody shoots you down and asks you stupid questions. How very strict about that. You get kicked off and be quicker than you could put your comment. So you can ask with freedom, and you've got all these experts on there, experienced guys, some are general practitioners who do amazing work and advanced work, like Dr. Wolfart, some are specialists that do work and they will give you input. So you're not left on your own. <clears throat> you can learn it and you can do it at your pace. You can do one module now. You can do one two years later. You can do, like I said, Mark Bose teaches you and that's what you can do. Because at the end of the day, all we are striving for is to give our patients a better aesthetics. And this <clears throat> picture I put up, this is from the DSD center as well. This is a denture people. This lady had to have a maxillectomy as you can see, and she had to have a denture. But even with a denture, they plan the look of the teeth to her facial proportions. See, they're not all in a straight line. And look how amazing and natural that aesthetics looks, even when you're making a denture. And with that, I thank you for your time and your attention. Uh Thank you very much, Bradley. That was awesome. Um, I think colleagues, if there are any questions, please go ahead and ask. I think there's a comment Thank there. You, Thank you. Enjoyed it. From Dr. Tsoka. Thank you. The hands Dr. clapping. Dr. Tsoka and Dr. Rusike, you made Dr. my evening. <laughs>
Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Amandishi. You are welcome. Ron's got my details. You're welcome to contact me. Socket shield appears so technique sensitive. You know, um, Dr. Ronga, I must say one thing to you. <clears throat> it is technique sensitive in, in a sense. You're right. Although, um, you know, we always talk about these things, um, Dr. Gluckman and myself and the other guys in the group. And often you'll have people that will show you this amazing result at a conference. And the problem is that's the one case out of 10 that they got that right with, and that's the case they want to do. And I'm not just for evidence-based because evidence, I can tell you now from my experience, is a lot of it is manipulated to give what the guy wants to say. <clears throat> I want, I believe in something, if it's a technique or somebody goes and a hundred guys out there are doing it and they're getting the similar results. And the thing with Socket Shield is I've seen many guys not even do it properly. They don't even do it properly and they still get a great result. And for me, give the alt I always ask myself, what is it that you would lose in trying that? <clears throat> you won't lose anything because if it works, you get this amazing route. If it doesn't work, you can end up where you would be with um, the, the extraction. There are kits that you can use. Um, Dr. Gluckman has developed a kit that makes life easier. And you can, if you're gonna do it, come to the course. We teach it at the immediate implant placement course. We teach it to you. You do it on models. You do it hands-on. We show you how to trim it, the step-by-step te -step technique of how to do the socket shield. So if you, but what I would say is if you in a practice where you are doing a fair number of implants and you want to <clears throat> hone your skill and do that, then it's worth your while to invest to come and learn the skill. If you're not doing a lot of aesthetic implants and doing posterior implants, because you can do socket shield posterior teeth as well. It's not only fancy teeth, but it has its biggest impact on the aesthetics then you can do that. Um, so don't be put off. I can tell you now it is most probably more technical to obturate a, a, mo a upper molar to with a root canal material than it is to do a socket shield technique. Uh, you want to repost the training schedule? Uh, sure. Uh, sorry. Where is it now? <clears throat> uh, I just asked Laura to send me this <clears throat> today. So the next one is the crown lengthening course. That's in three weeks time. That's done by Dr. Glackman and Dr. Um, Willy Ritz. Um, they're gonna be doing it. It's only a one day course. I think it's a Friday. Um, <clears throat> they do aesthetic crown length and they do just post your teeth. There's so, Dr. Uh, just to add that Dr. Mark Bose has this year started a diploma course in aesthetics, which I think in, in, in restorative, which is I think 13 or 14 modules. It's not cheap, I think it's 82,000 Rand for the whole course. Um, you can choose whether you want to do it over one year, two years, or I think three years. I speak under correction. And they discuss, they'll have a module on DSD, they'll have a module on <clears throat> occlusion, they'll have a module on orthodontics, clear liners, um, they'll have a module on um, um, uh, injection molding. Um, <clears throat> so injection molding is also like, you know, like even with DSD, you can have DSD where you, um, where you don't have to give the patient can't afford, afford it now, you can actually plan the DSD, do the preps and put them in long standing temps that will last them for about two to three years. And then what you do is you take it once they got the temps on because you've at least got the bite to the right position and everything else, you then go and you can then go and segmentally change the temps for permanent so they can have these 16 teeth done in the permanent porcelain then the next thing so as a patient saves up the money and do it there are ways you can make it affordable for patients and these are all techniques that they teach you and and and, and train you on <clears throat> with it and like i said it's not just surgical or not just restore even if you're a general practitioner who just does restorative work there's a lot for you just to do on Restore. They teach you how to do digital workflow. There's a course on that too. So if you want to learn how to just work digitally with your lab, 
And um, <clears throat> in fact, I had a technician, a dentist come down. I told him to come with his technician that works with me in Durban and he brought his technician and they were to the Christian coaching course and they were blown away because he didn't have to explain to his technician what he saw. He was there listening at the same time. And he spoke to me yesterday and said, his technician is just operating on a different level because he now sees why he needs to do it. And he takes extra steps and he does them and they're doing these amazing cases. And that's how we work, guys. We need to improve ourselves constantly. And we need to do, we owe it to our patients to hone our skills. Not that we're not good, but we can be better. We can always be better. And these opportunities are there now. My job is just to make you aware that they are there and you don't have to travel to the other side of the world now to get this training. You can come in the same time zone and how long is the flight from Zimbabwe? Two and a half, three hours, I'm guessing. I've never been there. Maybe my friend Ron will invite me one day. <laughs> You've got a standing invitation, Bradley. <laughs> oh no, thanks. I've got. I'm glad you say that, Ron. I've got about forty witnesses to that one, eh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if there are any other questions. I see the chat box is quiet now. So I think uh, we can close this session and. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for honoring us with your presence and sharing your knowledge with us. It's always a pleasure when I listen to you from back in the day at Stellenbosch when you'd present our seminars and <laughs> I always enjoyed them. So I hope my colleagues It's always also a pleasure. It's always a pleasure that. seeing you and chatting to you, my friend. As yeah. You know, we can chat for hours. That's Ron right. Ron used to come to my house on a Sunday afternoon for Sunday lunch, I used to go fetch Ron at the, I used to feel sorry for him and I used to pick him up at the student digs <laughs> and we used to be, and he used to come to my house and we'd have Sunday lunch with my parents, with my family and have long chats. <laughs> yeah. And I miss those days. Yeah, same here. No, we'll, we'll come now that things are opening up a little bit and you should come up here and we show you, you know, Zimbabwe. And 